Hey guys, in this episode, we're setting up our animation blueprint infrastructure for gameplay abilities, and we're also setting up our second gameplay ability of our game, Flamethrower. Let's get to it. Hey guys, I'm really excited for this episode, not only because of the flamethrower ability, obviously, but because we're putting together the foundational structure for all future gameplay animations. This episode builds on the previous episode, episode 26, where we put together the start of a gameplay ability system. So if you haven't checked that out, I strongly recommend you do so. And then in this episode, right after we get the animations we need to start, we're going to put together the starting point for a complete system for gameplay animations. Because we're gonna have a lot of these gameplay abilities and a lot of these animations, we need a simple system that's able to be replicated across every single animation. And then right after we have our structure, we're going to start with our second gameplay ability, which is the flamethrower. So in the last episode, we talked about these four quadrants in relation to the gameplay ability system. And in this episode, we're really going to be focused on the top right corner and the bottom left corner. In about five episodes, we're going to get started on our gameplay UI, starting with a hot bar. So basically, I want the player to be able to run over a gameplay ability or like pick up a gameplay ability goes into their hotbar, they can drag and drop it to whatever keyboard slot they want. But today we're going to stay focused on the basics of the ability, these two quadrants. Now in about 10 episodes or so, not till we get through some other gameplay ability stuff, that's when we'll start in the bottom right hand corner. And this is the most fun, but it's also the most complex. It's like, how is our gameplay ability actually going to play in the game? What is it going to affect in the game? In this episode, it's pretty intensive, but as detailed as it's going to get, we're going to use just one animation from Mixamo. Basically, we're splitting that animation into three parts. So we got a beginning of our effect, and then we got the middle, and the middle can be endlessly channeled, and then we have the end of the effect. And then also for the flamethrower sound itself, it's just one sound that we can get right off of Zapsplat. And as always, in the description below, you'll find a link to the spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet contains all the free assets that we're using in this series. And finally, here are our key concepts today. We are going to work a ton in our third-person character animation blueprint, starting with building a state machine from the ground up. So that state machine is going to serve as basically, well, not every single gameplay ability is going to run through that, but... Most animations for gameplay abilities are going to run right through that state machine. And I'm going to show you how we can connect that up to the rest of our animation states. And that's going to serve as the infrastructure for connecting every single animation for our entire game. So by the end of this episode, you're going to know all about state machines, transition rules, events, basically how to drive any kind of behavior across your game based on an animation. All right, so we're gonna start on Mixamo today, getting the animations we need. If you're not already familiar with the process of getting Mixamo animations mapped to the UE5 mannequin character, check out episode 25, it's got everything you need. And the animation that we're using today is the standing two-hand magic attack 04. And I've already uploaded my character, the SK mannequin for Mixamo from the Mixamo converter that we downloaded in episode 25. And before we download this, we actually have to break the animation into three pieces. We actually have to download three separate animations from this one animation. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to trim the number of frames. The reason we need to do that is because there's always going to be a start to a channeled animation. But then a channeled animation means the player can keep it going basically for as long as they want. And so that needs to be a separate animation because it can't really have an end. It's just got to keep going and going. And then, of course, we do have an end animation when the player pulls back from that channeling. So for the begin animation, we need to start this at 0, and we need to move this all the way to 30. So it should be a total of 31 frames. So we'll go ahead and download. And whenever you download these, just make sure it's without skin and uniform keyframe reduction. So we got our first one. So our second one is actually going to be from 33 to 77. So we'll go to frame 77, move this to 33, and we'll just test that out, make sure it's looping. Yeah, so basically it's just channeling, channeling, channeling. And you'll notice that it suddenly goes eh, when it cycles the animation. So we're going to address that in the state machine once we get into that. So we'll download this, and again without skin and uniform. And now the last animation, this goes from 94, or I should say it ends at 94, and it starts at 78. So I got to move this up, 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 right about there. Very short. Yeah, it's just him pulling back and he's done. And then we'll download this one. Same thing, without skin, uniform. So we should now have all three, and we are done with Mixamo. We can close out of this. So now I'm just going to rename these. So the first one we downloaded, this is going to end with begin. And the second one, this is going to be the channel. And the third one, this is going to be, of course, end. And so now we're going to follow the same process we did in episode 25. So I'll jump into my Mixamo converter folder. I'm going to drag these three animations into our incoming FBX folder. We'll open up Mixamo converter. 
click through this. Step two, convert. Go to that and convert. Should take just a few seconds because it's three animations. And then we can close out of this. We can just exit out. If I go to outgoing FBX, those are our three. And so now I'm gonna launch UE5. The last step is we gotta convert these from the UE4 mannequin into the UE5 mannequin. So now I'm gonna to navigate to our content drawer, back to content. We're gonna go into our characters, our mannequin UE4, because remember, these animations are for our UE4 mannequin to start. Into animations here, and I can drag and drop our standing two-hand magic attack begin, end, and channel. Drag those in, and we gotta pick a skeleton. We always have to pick the UE4 mannequin skeleton here. Make sure all your other settings match mine, including the import translation negative three, and then import all. And we can just double check, make sure our animation's imported correctly. So I'll double click on one of those, looks good. And so now we gotta move those animations from the UE4 mannequin over to Manny, our UE5 mannequin. So I'll go back to our content drawer, back to mannequin UE4 and to rigs. And then we have this RTG UE4 Manny to UE5 Manny. So I'll select that and I'll find the three animations we got here. So our begin, our channel, our end, I'm just holding control to select all three and then export selected animations. And these are gonna be back in our characters folder, mannequins under animations, Manny, and then Mixamo. Okay. And now we double check them. There's our begin animation and it's all mapped to Manny. We are good to go. So next we have to set up the Niagara system for our flamethrower effect. And at first I experimented with the new Niagara Fluids plugin on this. And unfortunately, I just couldn't find a good effect that I thought would work well. So the 2D effect just didn't work well projecting a fire out in space. And for the 3D effect, well, I tried that out, but it just looked grainy. Maybe Unreal Engine will improve this in the future, but the best fire I found is actually from a classic effect. And it's from the starter content that we enabled all the way back in episode three. So if you navigate to content and then under starter content, and then we have to go into particles here. And it's actually this P fire, and this is Cascade. Cascade is the legacy particle system before Niagara even existed. And if you don't see any of these folders, if you don't see the starter content, it just means that your particular project doesn't have starter content enabled. So what I would do is create a brand new project with starter content enabled and just click and drag those folders into your project. And then you should have this available. But we don't want to use this with Cascade, right? We want to convert this into Niagara. So luckily there's a plugin that we can enable for doing just that. So if you go up to settings and then plugins and you search for Cascade to Niagara, and we've got this Cascade to Niagara converter, and I can check that, yes, and we'll restart. So now that I've got the project restarted, I'll go back to our content drawer, back to our particles folder. I'm gonna right click on this P fire and then convert to Niagara system. And this will take just a few seconds, but then you'll have this P fire converted. Now I'm gonna move this into the Niagara folder that I created a few episodes ago. So under Niagara and then gameplay abilities, we have fire and I'm actually gonna create a new folder titled flamethrower. And so now if I scroll down and go under particles here, starter content particles and go back there, and then I'm gonna expand fire and I can click and drag P fire converted into flamethrower and move here. And so now I'm gonna rename this. So we'll go to rename and I'm gonna name it NS underscore fire flamethrower base. And this is gonna be the base flamethrower effect. And the reason I'm naming it base is because I'm also gonna duplicate this in a little bit. And we're gonna create an effect that can actually vary based on a user parameter that we pass in. And that's the intensity of the gameplay ability. But I always wanna keep this base effect so I have a pristine copy of the flamethrower. So let's go into that. And unfortunately we need to fix a number of things post conversion. So let's start with that and we'll go from there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna deactivate some of these emitters because we don't need all these emitters. I'm gonna deactivate the smoke, the embers, the sparks. I think the best effect for the magical looking fire I've got in mind, we don't even need these. We do need the distortion though, so I'm gonna keep that. I'm just gonna move these over to the right. I'm gonna move distortion over to the left. So really these three emitters are what we need to fix. So the first thing I need to do is acknowledge and clear all these issues. And this is gonna take a few minutes, so just spend the time and click on those because we also need to do it in the emitters themselves. So I'm just gonna expand all these, acknowledge and clear this issue and expand every single one of these and acknowledge and clear, acknowledge and clear, and just go down the list and do this for every single one. And then on to the other two. And the reason we need this distortion effect is if you've ever seen a fire or kind of on a hot day right above a highway, you can always see the air being kind of wavy in the distance, being a little bit fuzzy and distorted. That's exactly what this is doing. All right, so now we're actually ready to create the flamethrower effect. But we have a bit of a challenge, and that is that you see both of these, flames and flames 001. Both of these are set to emit light. They have a light renderer down here. 
And the thing that I've noticed is that rendering particles as light is very performance intensive. And so what I initially tried to do is I tried to convert them over to GPU emitters, doesn't work for the light renderer. And then the other problem I ran into is when converting them to GPU emitters, the collision, it just didn't look nearly as good when I kept them as CPU. And so I was thinking to myself, okay, how do we have the flamethrower still emit light without really hurting our performance while keeping these CPU emitters? And so the solution that I came upon is that one of these emitters is going to be set to emit light and the other one is not, but it's going to provide the illusion that the entire flamethrower system is emitting light. And the one that is emitting light, it's going to have far fewer particles, about one fifth as many particles. So we can have a very dense system, but the performance will be much less. So let's go ahead and make the updates to our first emitter here, flames. So over in spawn rate, I'm going to change this to be 15. And this one is the one that is going to emit light. Now for our shape location sphere, I'm going to change this down to about 10. It's going to be a lot smaller. So it's emanating directly from our hands. This add velocity node, we're going to disable that. And for this add velocity 001 node, we just need to update it a little bit. So the X, we're going to add a zero to all of these. So instead of 35, it's going to be 350. The Z is going to be 50. And down here, instead of 60, it's going to be 600. And the Z is 100. I just want to mention it's really important to keep the rotation coordinate space local because that's what's going to orient our flamethrower based on whatever position our Niagara system is in. And then for this field, dynamic material parameters, we can uncheck that. We can uncheck it also down here. So we're not going to use any of these at this time. Now for the scale sprite size. So initially the fire is starting very, very tiny, almost at nothing. And we don't want that. So instead of starting at zero here, we want to start it at about 0.5. It is going to get bigger with time, but it's going to start at about half size and go to full size from there. And then underneath acceleration force here, we're going to add a collision node. So I can hit the plus sign and search for a collision. So just a few things we need to change in this collision node. So the restitution, it's going to be 0.05. So not much of a bounce for the light emitting particles. For the randomized collision normal vector, I'm going to up this to 0.2, basically double it. And you see here it says a value of 0 will prevent the surface normal from being randomized within a cone. So there's some randomization to the bounce here, and I'm increasing that a little bit. And for the friction for this emitter, I'm going to set it to 0.9 and the friction during a bounce is also going to be 0.9. Because for the light particles, I don't want those to bounce too much, right? I want the light to generally emanate right in the middle of the cone, like right in the middle where the fire is being projected. Now the last thing, and this is important because initially I forgot this and it caused all sorts of problems when I activated the flamethrower. So this CPU collision trace channel, change that from world dynamic to pawn. And now let's go on to our second emitter here. So we'll start with our spawn rate. So this is always going to be spawning roughly five times as many particles as the first one. So the first one was 20. This is going to be 100. And you see it already there on the left hand side getting more intense. And then under initialize particle, we're going to randomize the size of these particles a little bit. So instead of non uniform, we're going to do a random non uniform. And this is going to vary from 40 to 70 and then 60 to 90. And then for the sprite rotation mode, unset this. So now on to sphere location. So we're going to give this a radius of 10, just like the other particles. We're going to disable the add velocity node, just like other particles. And then the add velocity here, again, add a zero to all of these. So it's going to be 350, Z50, X600, and Z100. Whoops, 100. Once again, we're going to uncheck the dynamic material parameters also right here, uncheck that. And for this emitter, we're going to uncheck the light renderer because only the first one is going to emit light. Once again, under scale sprite size, we're going to move that up to 0.5. So it's going to start out about half size and you see it there. And once again, we're going to add a collision node. So under acceleration force, I'll just hit plus sign and we're going to add collision. So if you remember for the first one, we said the restitution, the bounce is going to be very low. So for this one, it's very high. The fire is going to bounce a lot. And then the randomized collision normal will also keep that 0.2. And then down here for friction, I'm going to make that 0.9. Friction during a bounce, I'm going to lower that a little bit, so 0.3. And once again, don't forget, so CPU collision trace channel, change this to pawn. A good double check is just making sure you've unchecked the light renderer, you've unchecked dynamic material parameters for both of these, and this second add velocity node. So on to our third emitter, and this is going to be a little bit easier. So spawn rate, we're setting this to 125, so a pretty high spawn. And for the spawn burst instantaneous, it's not spawning anything, so you could just uncheck that. And now for initialized particle, we're going to change that lifetime to be the same as the others, so 0.7 to 1.0. And that's also what these are by default. And then for the sprite size mode, we're going to change this to random uniform, and it's going to be from 10 to 15. Once again, sprite rotation mode, we're going to unset that. And now for the add velocity, same thing we've been doing. So we add a zero onto all of these. So 350, 50 for the Z, 
x600, z100. And also once again, under scale sprite size, we're gonna move this up to 0.5 to start. And last but not least, under the acceleration force, once again, we're adding a collision node. Restitution's gonna be 0.7, lot of bounce. And the randomized collision normal, also 0.2. Friction is going to be 0.9 and friction during a bounce 0.5. One thing I forgot, so under collision for both this and this, so select the advanced aging rate and set this to 5 and the same thing here, advanced aging rate, set this to 5. And what this is going to do is as soon as there's a collision, it's going to age the particles more quickly. But I'm not going to do that, I don't think, for the first emitter because I want the light to be more intense at whatever it's hitting. And this way the particles will accumulate there and make it more intense. And back in our distortion collision effect, we've got to change our CPU collision trace channel once again to pawn. So now let's go ahead and save, compile, and we'll close this out. Before I test this out, let's enable show FPS so we can see our frames per second before and after. So we're looking here at about 57 to 60. And now let's drag in our flamethrower, move it up a little bit, and look at our FPS. So now it's only about 55 to 57. So it looks like it's about a two to three FPS hit, which is not too bad. If I get in close, it's a little bit lower, but then it stabilizes and now it's colliding. And I see some of the particles kind of bouncing off. If I move it over a little bit, now more of the particles. Yeah, so it's a really cool collision effect there. And by the way, if you experiment with this and you come up with better ways of doing the collision off these particles, I would love to know. So please post in the comments below. So now that we got our pieces, we got our animations, we got our Niagara system, it's time to actually set up our state machine. So let's go into our animation blueprint. We got to find your animation blueprint wherever that is, but that's in the core folder that we set up in episode three of this series. So in episode 23, we began talking about the anim graph and then also state machines. So state machines are collections of animations that make up a particular state. So is the character idling, walking, running, spell casting in our case today. And then all those state machines are organized together in this anim graph to create what's called the output pose, often called the final pose. And that is what our character's position, animation, like what is going on with our character in the current moment. And so the way UE5 set this up by default is there's a locomotion state machine, idling and walking and running. That's specifically the standalone thing just for locomotion. And so that's my idea to emulate, that we're going to set up a spellcasting state machine that's basically going to be its own standalone thing, such that any animation for spellcasting, we can tie directly into that state machine. And the way we're going to start, if you go back to your anim graph, so if you right click here, we're going to do a brand new state machine. So new state machine, add new state machine. And I'm just going to move the locomotion up a little bit so that this can be directly adjacent to it. And then on the left here under anim graph, this is where all our state machines show up. So I'm just going to right click, rename, and it's going to be spellcasting standing still. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go into our spellcasting standing still and we're going to create a brand new state. So right click and add state. And this is going to be spellcasting. And the way I'm thinking about this is it's basically going to be a switchboard of all different spells. So whenever we go into the spellcasting standing still, it's all going to go to this spellcasting node. There's going to be kind of like an idle animation for spellcasting here. And then it's going to flip out to whatever other spellcasting animation we need. So I'm just going to drag a pin from entry to spellcasting. But how do we connect this up now to everything else going on? So back in our anim graph. So directly adjacent to the spellcasting standing still here, I'm going to right click and I'm going to search for a new cache posed or a new cached pose. So if you look at the help text here, it says denotes an animation tree that can be referenced elsewhere in the blueprint, which will be evaluated at most once per frame and then cached. And so we're going to set this up to work basically the same way as locomotion up here. It's basically got a state machine and then whatever it's doing in locomotion, then it saves that all under this locomotion pose and it loads those in all into the main output pose here. So I'm going to do a new save cached pose and then we got to rename this again to be spellcasting standing still compile and save. So basically this is going to save and use the pose of whatever this state machine is doing. But how do we actually connect to this state machine? Like how do we tell this state machine to be used? So it's all going to run through our main states here. So if I go to our main state state machine, so this is where locomotion gets connected. And from locomotion, that's where we're going to connect to our spell casting standing still state machine. And so now we're going to right click and add state and we're going to name this spell casting standing still. And I'm going to put spaces in these just to be consistent with like fall loop and two falling. And then if I double click on this, I can then use the cached pose, use cached pose spellcasting standing still. And that's what's going to be used in this node 
when it gets called from main states. So I can go right back to main states. And now we got to hook up locomotion to it to tell the overall main state state machine, okay, when do you switch from locomotion to spell casting standing still and use that cached pose that we just captured. So we need to connect up an arrow here from there to there and then from there to here. And these arrows are transition rules and the rules are what defines, okay, when do we transition from locomotion to spell casting standing still and vice versa. So for a rule, what do we need? So right now it's always going to be false. So we need some sort of variable to determine whether it's going to be true or false. So let's create that variable. So over on the left hand side, plus sign, and I'm going to name it spell casting standing still. And that's not going to work because the name is already in use. So I'll just give it a question mark at the end and we'll keep this to be a Boolean variable. So if I double click on the rule here and then I can say spell casting standing still and actually this one, let me just go back into the main states here. So that one is connecting from standing still back to locomotion. So in that case, I want this to not be true. So if I go back into that, we've got our variable and I can just set this to not. So not that one, this one, and then I'll connect this up compile, save, go back to main states, and we'll do the same thing with the other rule. But in this case, yes, we do want to make sure it is true, just like that. Compile, save, back to main states. And I'm just going to move this down here. Yep. So now we got our two rules. We've got our spell casting standing still node. And when spell casting standing still is true, it goes to that and then it uses this cached pose. But we still haven't set up this state machine, right? We don't have any animations yet in this state machine whatsoever. So if we go back to spell casting standing still here, so this is where all the different animations are going to be playing from. But the challenge here, eventually, I'm probably going to have dozens of animations in here, right? Because we're going to have a lot of different spells. And I was thinking about this, and the problem is it's going to be really annoying to follow everything if it's got like, let's say there's 12 different animations and each one has two spokes going back and forth. And that's going to be a lot of spokes all around this. So it would be nice if we can organize this in such a way that we could individually have those different spells that we're casting. Like they don't have to have arrows across the screen for every single thing. So I have a way of connecting all our different animations in the future to this without drawing arrows. But first, let's start with the three animations that we brought in. So if we go back to our content drawer, back to content, characters, mannequins, animations, Manny, Mixamo. And so we have our begin animation, we have our channel, and we have our end. So hold tight here because we got to create three nodes that correspond to those three animations. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a state. And this is going to be channeled spell begin. And then I'm going to right click and add another state. And this is going to be channeled spell loop. And the last one is I'm sure you guess it, but add state channeled spell end. And I'll just drag these up a little bit, make some space. So the way this is going to work is spell casting is going to call channeled spell begin when it's supposed to channel a spell. And then the channel spell begin animation is going to connect to the channel spell loop animation. And that's going to keep looping, keep looping, keep looping until the channel is over. And then it's going to go into the end animation here and then right back out. So now I got to connect up the corresponding animations to each of these, right? So under channel spell begin, I'll go into that, go back to our content drawer. That's going to be this one begin and connect that up. And when you do that, just make sure to uncheck the loop animation here because we don't want our begin animation to loop or our end animation for that matter. So just the middle animation. And then I can go right back to spell casting standing still now onto the loop. And this one is going to loop. So we drag in our channel one, connect that up, compile, save. And last but not least, go back and get our end. Oop, I got to go back into the end node first, and then I can do it. Drag that in and connect that up and uncheck loop. Compile save. Yeah, so when I compile, I get this message down here saying channeled spell begin to channeled spell loop will never be taken. Please connect something so can enter transition. And the reason I'm getting that error is because it's never going to reach this point to go here because nothing's connected to this. So how do we connect spell casting over to this without drawing a million arrows like I was mentioning before? So we can add what's called a state alias and an alias is a way of calling other nodes without drawing the arrows. So I can right click and I can say add state alias and I can call this two channeled spell and we'll take this path whenever we're doing a channeled spell and you could tell it what nodes you want to connect it to. So two channeled spell is always going to connect to just the channeled spell begin and then I'm going to draw an arrow right back to it. But the problem still remains that we're getting these errors and that's because we haven't defined any criteria by which these rules are actually going to be taken as they stand. All these rules are currently false. So we need to define those criteria. So when do we want the channeled spell begin to transition over to channeled spell loop? 
really it's whenever that begin animation is just about finished, right? So the animation is completing and then it's just gonna do, so it's doing this, it's going and then boom. And then the channel spell is just gonna, it's just channeling the flamethrower. And so whenever the channel spell begin goes from this to about here, that's when we wanna make the switch. So how can we tell this rule, okay, at what point in this animation do we wanna make the switch? So if we go into that rule, and if I right click here and I search for time remaining, so we can get a criteria of the time remaining on the animation. And usually what I do is time remaining if that is less than, and I say 0.1 seconds. So that would only be an issue if our frame rate drops below 10. And if our frame rate's below 10, we've got other problems. So I think that's always gonna catch the animation in time and then it will transition over. And then I can connect this up. So basically, if there's less than a tenth of a second left on that animation, switch over to our channel animation, compile and save. And now we have one fewer error, so that did it. So let's go on to our next one. So for this one, we can't actually do the same thing, right? Because this could be playing indefinitely. It could loop and loop and loop and loop. So we're not gonna suddenly transition to end the spell automatically. So basically, this has to be a variable of some kind. And so for that, I'm gonna create a new variable and I'm gonna call this variable channel spell. And the reason I'm creating a new variable is because while well, spellcasting standing still, it's gonna end everything in the state machine. I don't wanna skip over the end animation because I don't want the player to go from this to like in like 0.2 seconds. I want like a little bit more time where they can end the spell and it'll look a little bit more natural. So to enter this transition, let's go into that and this channeled spell. So it's only gonna end the spell. It's only gonna end the animation if it's not equal to channel spell, actually not that one. So we gotta search for not, and we gotta come up here, not Boolean. And then we connect that up. Because as long as channel spell is true, here's what it's gonna do. So let me compile and save. It's gonna stick right in this node. And so now that we have that channel spell Boolean, that's exactly what's gonna drive this right here. So spell casting, we could have channeled spells, we could have a one-time cast, like in a few episodes, we're gonna do a fireball, that's gonna be a lot of fun. And so if it's a channeled spell, that's when it's gonna enter here, it's gonna call this node, and it's gonna do its loop thing. But for a fireball, it's gonna be a standalone animation, that's gonna do something else off of this. All right, so let's go into this rule that's connecting spell casting to channeled spell. We're gonna drag in our channeled spell Boolean, connect that one up, compile, save. We got one more warning back to spell casting standing still. And this one, it's just gonna be a not Boolean. So not, I don't know why it doesn't go all the way up to the top, it should. And then right there, compile, save. All of our warnings are gone. We are good to go. The very last thing, you heard me say that the spell casting here is gonna be kind of a switchboard. So the player's not gonna be sitting in the spell casting mode very long, but at the same time, I wanna give it an animation. So if I double click into that, and so the animation that I'm gonna to give to this is this standing idle retargeted. So this is actually from episode 25 when we first brought animations from Mixamo into Unreal Engine. And this is the end of the episode where we got a whole pack of animations. So feel free to check back on that. I'm not actually sure if you need this, but I think you should have it there just in case there's any time between the spell casting state machine and going back to the locomotion state machine. You want that in between. And I think this idle pose is a good in between. So we can connect that up. And that one I am gonna loop because it's just an idle pose. All right, I know that was a lot. I know it's confusing. So let's kind of go through the logic. So we go to main states. So here's what's happening. Player is idling or they're running or they're walking and then they receive an input to cast a spell and that's gonna be driven off of our third person character. We haven't gotten to that yet. But when that happens, so spell casting standing still is gonna be true. It's gonna go right into this. And then it's getting use cash pose from spell casting standing still. So that's being driven from the spell casting standing still state machine. So we'll go into that. And so that goes to spell casting. And then it also checks, okay, so spell casting standing still is true, but is channeled spell true? And if that's true, then it goes to channeled spell here. And that is connected up to channel spell begin here. So I don't have to connect this whole thing over to spell casting. It can be a standalone thing. I can move it to whatever part of the graph I want. And it's always gonna start here. It's gonna go to the last 0.1 second of that animation. It's gonna transition into the loop and it's only gonna leave the loop if the channeled spell Boolean is no longer true. And then it'll go to end. And at the same time, or right after, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the spell casting standing still so that it goes back, back to the locomotion state machine. So these two Booleans, spell casting standing still and the channel spell, there's gonna be a slight delay in the impact for both so that there's enough time to do the end spell animation. 
I know that's a lot. I know it's confusing, but it's imperative that we set up the structure for all subsequent spells and abilities. So let's go into our third person character blueprint and let's actually test this out. So I'm going to navigate back to our content drawer and then over to content in our core folder, open up our third person character blueprint. And so for this, I just want to get the simplest possible test of our animation up and running. So because I've already got the keyboard one here from our previous ability, I'm just going to right click search for keyboard two from keyboard two, simplest possible test. So we're going to do a flip flop. So next we have to reference our animation blueprint. So like we've done in previous episodes, I'm just going to drag in our anim BP drag out a reference and I'll get spell casting standing still. And we actually have to set that variable. So at first we're going to set that to true. I'll connect up a to that. And then we got to do it one more time, drag in a reference and we have to get channel spell or set channel spell. And we're also going to set that to true. So now we can copy these, paste them down here, set them both to false. And that's the value of the flip flop, getting a quick test up and running. But you heard me say earlier that we want a 0.2 second delay between these two. And actually we want the channeled spell first. So I'm going to change the order of these. So the channeled spell is what's going to end first. And then we're going to play our end animation. And then we're going to do our spell casting standing still. So I'll put in here a retriggerable delay. It'll be about 0.2 seconds of that end animation. And then it will connect up here, compile and save. And keep in mind, this is not testing the Niagara integration at all yet. All we're testing at this point is whether the animation will work. So here we go, moment of truth. Two on our keyboard and there's the animation and I'm channeling it and yeah, it looks pretty good. But I do see two problems, right? So one is every time it loops the channeled animation, it's going, eh, eh. it's like that spasm effect because the loop isn't ending on the same exact position of our player's body as where it's beginning. And then the other issue I'm seeing, if we look at his feet, his feet are kind of floating off the ground there. So let's take care of the second issue first, the feet issue, and then we'll take a look at the spasming. So to fix the feet floating issue, we got to go back to our ABP third person character. And specifically, we have to go back to the anim graph. So go into that. And I actually alluded to this problem in episode 25 when we first got Mixamo animations into our game. And basically the situation is anytime our player's feet are going to be moving in any regard, we really need to turn off the foot IK trace here. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to evaluate whether or not the player is spell casting standing still. And if they're not spell casting standing still, and they're not is falling, then it will do control rig. But if they're spell casting standing still, I don't want to do this because the feet are going to be floating off the ground. So from spell casting standing still, I'll just drag out a pin, do a not Boolean. And then between these two, I'm going to do an and. So both of these need to be true in order for, well, actually this I'm going to connect here, that I'm going to connect there. And both of these need to be true in order to do IK trace, move this out just a little bit. And this no debug data, I'm just going to say no debug object selected just to get rid of that. Compile and save. All right, here we go. Two. Nope, feet look good. Feet are on the ground. We still got the spasming, but the feet look fine. If I press two again, I'm back to normal. And then I'm back to running and walking along the ground. So now let's talk about the spasming issue when the animation is looping. So for that, we've got to go back into our anim graph and a spell casting standing still state machine. And that's occurring because of this looping right here. So we'll go into our channel spell and I'll actually go into the animation. I'll show you what's going on here. So you see, as this is looping, you see it right there. It's coming back to frame one and it's boop and a boop and a boop. Now, to be honest, the solution I've got for this, it's probably not the best solution to the issue. So if you have a better one that could be done with completely free assets, I'm all ears. But this solution does work very well for me and I can't even tell the difference. And so the way we're going to address this is if you go back into your animation blueprint, and we go back to spell casting standing still. So whenever it blends from one animation to another, it always blends over a certain amount of time. And you can see that by selecting the rule here and looking on the right hand side, duration 0.2 seconds, and it blends via this mode of Hermite cube. I have no idea what that means, but it basically blends seamlessly between this animation and that animation. And so my thinking for solving this is, well, why don't we just duplicate this node, right? This state, and we could just blend between the two and then regardless of whichever one is currently playing, then we can end the animation here. And I actually have one more enhancement to this, but this is a pretty easy fix and it does the job just fine in my view. So we can control C copy and then control V paste over here. And then this one, I'm actually going to rename this to channeled spell loop two. And this one I'll just rename and say channeled spell loop 
one. And then I can connect both of these up. So we have a rule this way, we got a rule that way, and we're gonna do the same thing that we did over here, which is when this one is all the way at the end, like it's only got a 10th of a second left, then it's gonna transition into this one and vice versa. So I can click on our top rule and then just search for time remaining. And we'll choose the last one here. If the time remaining is less than, and let's do 0.1 again, so less than 0.1 seconds, then it will transition. Compile and save, we'll do the same exact thing for the other one. So we'll go into the bottom rule and we'll get time remaining and same thing and is less than 0.1 or less than, yep, 0.1 and connect this up. Now there's one other idea I have to give this just a little bit more variance and that is, so back in our channeled spell loop two state, so if you double click into this, so what I decided to do is let's actually play this one backwards. So the first one plays forward and then the second one plays backwards. And in my view, that's a really good thing to do because it makes the animation channeling like twice as long. And that way the blending between the two, I think is gonna be a little bit more seamless. And also the animation gets varied up a little bit. So what we can do is we can set the play rate here to negative one, which is pretty neat. So you see, if I hover over that, it says the play rate multiplier can be negative, which will cause the animation to play in reverse. Now, if we want it to play in reverse, we got to start it all the way at the end. So I can start it at one here and I'm not going to loop it, right? Because I don't want to loop either one of these. If I go back to spell casting, standing still, channel spell loop one. So this one is going to play from the beginning, but I don't want it to loop because it's going to go right into the other one. But then the last thing I need to do is I need to hook up an arrow here because regardless of which one of these is playing, like if channeled spell stops, then we want it to go into the end animation. So basically what I want to do is if I go into this one, I could just copy this logic and go back to the other rule and then paste and that should work just fine. Compile save. So now what happens is it starts the same way. It goes into the loop and it keeps looping back and forth between these. It should blend seamlessly between these, but we're going to test that out. And then from either one, it can end just fine. So let's give this a whirl. All right, here we go. Two. Any spasming? Aha, no more spasming. He is seamlessly channeling, hit two again, and he's back to normal. Now for the rest of this episode, we're gonna get all of this integrated with Niagara and then also our gameplay ability system. If you haven't already checked out the previous episode on setting up a gameplay ability system via Blueprint from scratch, strongly recommend you check that out because we're gonna be building on all of that setup now. So for this, we're gonna need our two gameplay ability blueprints that we've already set up. So if you go back to your content drawer and we save those under content and blueprints under gameplay abilities, we're going to need our gameplay ability blueprint and then also of course our gameplay ability fire blueprint. So last episode we integrated our very first ability which was the torchlight ability in episode 23. We integrated that into the system and we did that by spawning this Niagara system torchlight effect right here. But here's the thing, so every ability in our game is going to have a different Niagara system. Now some might not even use Niagara, but for fire, pretty much everything is gonna use Niagara. Because when a gameplay ability is spawned, like let's say for example, the gameplay ability is picked up by the player, we wanna be able to change what the Niagara system is based on what they picked up. But Niagara systems are gonna be relevant for most abilities we have in the game. Not everything, but most, definitely more than just fire. So because of that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new variable for the Niagara system on the gameplay ability blueprint. So navigate over to the gameplay ability here, and then we can come down here and create a new variable. And I'm gonna call this the primary Niagara system. And instead of a Boolean, obviously I'm gonna change this to Niagara system. And we'll choose Niagara system and an object reference. Now, because we're gonna change this, depending on what the ability is, we need to make it instance editable and exposed on spawn compile and save. So now let's go over to our third person character blueprint because I wanna go over what's happening when we choose one right now, which is what we set up last episode. So we've got our gameplay ability that's spawning and this is of type fire, but you see here, we don't yet have an option to define the Niagara system. So now that I made that variable, I can get that option, but in order to do so, I need to unselect the class and then I need to choose the class again. So I'm gonna select none and then I'm gonna go back to gameplay ability fire and then I should see it. Yeah, there it is, primary Niagara system. So for this, I'm just gonna choose the Torchlight ability, Torchlight NS. And now we'll just compile and save. And the last thing I'm going to do to get this set up with the new variable is on gameplay ability fire, if I search for primary Niagara system, I can get a reference to that. And then I can connect that up to the spawn system attached. So that's gonna determine what system gets spawned now into this Niagara system. So the way this is working is on the third person character, I hit the number one 
If it's not valid, meaning the actor doesn't exist, it spawns an actor of gameplay ability fire. That goes over to gameplay ability, and gameplay ability communicates gameplay ability fire, and it says, okay, is the fire ability type light only? Okay, we're going to hold up the arm, we're going to wait 0.2 seconds, and then we're going to spawn this torchlight. But now we've defined the primary Niagara system in the third person character down here when we actually spawn the ability. So because of that, I can just connect this up and it's going to use this variable, the system that we defined in order to spawn the appropriate Niagara system. So let's give this a whirl, compile, save, let's test this out. And all this is doing is it's verifying with the new setup that our ability from last episode still works appropriately. So one, yep, we got our torchlight ability one again, good. So now back in our third person character blueprint, we're gonna leverage the same setup, the spawn actor gameplay ability fire. We're gonna leverage that for number two here. So we can delete out all this. And this is just gonna be on keyboard number two, but we could set this up for any keyboard button you want. Now, eventually you heard me say, we're gonna have a hop bar and this is gonna be tied to an actual gameplay ability icon. You can drag that into different slots. That's coming up in about five episodes, hang tight. So to start down here, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna copy all of this and I'm gonna paste it down here for number two, create a little bit more space. So I'll move number two down, pressed, connect this up. But now we gotta change the properties of our spawned actor, right? So instead of light only, this is gonna be a channeled spell. And for the primary Niagara system, we gotta switch this out too, right? So this is gonna be our flamethrower. So NS fire flamethrower base. Now this intensity is not doing anything yet, but I'm just gonna set this to 20 just for starters. Compile and save. So now as I'm testing this, I'm spamming too and nothing's happening. Why? It's because for fire abilities that are channel, so on our gameplay ability fire, we haven't set up channel to actually do anything. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to set the two variables that are on our animation blueprint. We need to set those to true. So I can get a reference to our animation blueprint. So I can right click ABP and get ABP third person character reference. I could also just copy it from here. And the first variable we need to set is spellcasting. Spellcasting standing still, and that's gonna be set to true. And I can connect that up to channel right here. Then I can copy this again, and we also got another variable, right? We got our channel. So channel, set channel spell. And that's also gonna be set to true. And let me make some space here. So I'm gonna drag these down. I'll drag this one, this is the deactivate, I'll drag this down, because eventually we're gonna need space for four of these paths. So now from here, I could just spawn the Niagara system right away, right? But we actually have that intro animation first where the player kind of goes like this and then they go boom. So we wanna wait a period of time before spawning the Niagara system. And at first, I'm just gonna do this with the delay, but subsequently, you're gonna see how we do this in a much more sophisticated manner. So to start, just to get this up and running, we're gonna do a re-triggerable delay. And I'm gonna set this to about 0.8 seconds because the start animation, it's kind of long, like the player goes back and then they go forward. And then for our Niagara system, because it's running off of the primary Niagara system that we spawned on the third person character blueprint, I could just copy and paste this right here because this is gonna be different depending on what's set right here. And so now we gotta do the same kind of thing for deactivate, right? So I'm gonna select these two variables, spell casting, standing still, and the channel spell, I can copy those, come back to deactivate, and channel, when it deactivates, these are gonna be set to false. And then I can also do this destroy components. So Niagara system, I'll connect this up. So now let's test this out. In the rest of this episode, it's gonna be a lot of these tests. There's gonna be issues along the way, we're gonna solve them and a couple of enhancements as well. So if I hit two, and there's our flamethrower ability. So that's our first problem, right? It's aimed in the wrong direction. So let's fix that. So in our gameplay ability fire, I played with this a lot. We gotta change our location to be 000, so right at the right hand. And our rotation, this is a little weird, but if you had the exact Niagara settings that I had, it's gonna be Y equals 167 and Z negative 26. Compile and save. Moment of truth. Yeah, now it's actually shooting directly straight. And it's a little wobbly, right? Because the channel is actually shaking the player's hand. But I think that's perfect for a flamethrower. You don't want a spell casting effect that's just solid line, like it's not a laser. But one thing I don't like is when I hit two, it's a really abrupt transition. The player just goes, Boom. So could we slow that down a little bit, make it a little smoother of a transition? So to change that transition, let's go back into our animation blueprint, and then let's go into the main state state machine. And this transition right here from spell casting standing still to locomotion, if you select that, we can actually change the duration of that to be a little bit longer, so 0.4 seconds. By default, all transitions are 0.2 seconds, but what I'm thinking is, 
we go back into the spell casting standing still here. So the transition back to spell casting here is going to be 0.2 seconds. Player is going to be kind of in that idle state for just like a very short time, like 0.2 seconds. And then it'll go right back to main states, which is the locomotion here. Compile, save, one more test. So now I hit two. That looks good. I hit two again. Yep. And we're right back to normal, but it's a little bit smoother. So two. Yeah, not nearly as quick, but there's still some issues with this as it stands. And you could try this out for yourself right now if you're following along, but spam two, like just hit the number two a ton. And your player is going to probably get stuck in a position like this with the Niagara system actually going. And the reason that that kind of stuff can occur is that even if we time things perfectly with the delays, there could be a slight difference in, say, the animation delay versus what's happening on the blueprint. So we got to set up a way to really synchronize those two things. Like really, ultimately, the animation or the completion of an animation needs to be able to drive what the blueprint's going to do. And in general, using delay nodes, it's the sloppiest way to do things. Like whenever possible, if there's a better way of doing it, we should always do it a different way. So here's what I want to do instead. I want to set up an event on our gameplay ability blueprint and our gameplay ability fire blueprint for activating the primary Niagara system. And then what we can do in our state machine, we can actually drive an event based on the completion of an animation. So we could say, okay, don't actually start the Niagara until the animation is complete. And that's really the only thing then that drives the Niagara system spawn. So we're gonna follow much the same pattern from the last episode. So first we're gonna go to gameplay ability and back to our event graph. And now, if you remember from last episode, this is basically acting as a switchboard for our more specific gameplay ability blueprints. So we've got our activate ability and deactivate ability here, but we're just gonna create another custom event called activate primary Niagara system. So we'll do a custom event. And this is gonna be activate primary Niagara system. And then once I've got that up and running, I can come over to our gameplay ability fire and I'll do almost the exact same thing. So let me just drag this down for deactivate. And I'll do the same thing, but custom event, and we're going to name this slightly differently. We're going to say activate primary fire Niagara system. And that way we don't mix up those two events. So back in our main gameplay ability blueprint. So we got to take all of this piece and we'll paste that down here. And actually, I'm going to move the deactivate underneath because activate and deactivate should always be separated. So all of our activate stuff is up here, deactivates down here. Okay, so when we cast the gameplay ability fire, then we're going to get activate primary fire Niagara system. And that's why I differentiate the two events. Compile, save this. We'll go back to our gameplay ability fire. So from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first just going to copy and paste the switch. So we're going to copy and paste that here, connect this up. And then when a channeled spell, when a channeled fire spell gets called, that's when the flamethrower gets activated. So all this stuff right here, that's the Niagara effect. So channel gets connected up here, and then I'm gonna move all these down a little bit just to make space, we'll create some more space because deactivates gotta be all the way down there. And delete out these, delete out our retriggerable delay there. Compile and save. But now we need a way of triggering, basically calling the activate primary fire Niagara system from our animation, right? So what animation should drive spawning this Niagara system? So let's go back into our animation blueprint and let's go back into our spell casting standing still. So which of these animations should trigger our Niagara system to actually be spawned? It's really the transition from this to this, right? So it's really when the channel spell begin is ending and then the loop is beginning and that's when the Niagara system needs to start. So let's go into this animation and we'll double click on the actual animation here. And so to do this, we're gonna use an Atom Notify. And to make an Atom Notify, we did this for footstep effects, but we're gonna to come to the end of the animation, basically wherever we want that to start spawning Niagara particles. So somewhere around here, like where the hands are already coming out. And then I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna say, add notify, new notify. And I'm gonna call this activate main ability effect. And it's gonna show up with a little diamond right there. And the cool thing about those Atom Notifies is once you create them, then we can call them in the event graph. So if we go back to our Animation Blueprint event graph, and I'm going to come down here, come down here, and I can search for Activate Main Ability Effect. And so from here, what we need to do is we need to get our activated gameplay ability. And then from our activated gameplay ability, then we can call, okay, activate the Niagara system. So when this gets triggered, here's what's going to happen is going to get this activated gameplay ability that we set up last episode on our third person character blueprint. And then once we get that, then we can tell it, okay, 
do the activation do the activate primary niagara system here which is going to figure out okay it is a fire ability cast to our active primary fire niagara system and that's going to come over here and it's going to come to this and then it's going to say is that a channel defect yes and then it's going to do its thing spawn the system and it's all tied then to whatever the animation is doing so back in our animation blueprint Let's get a reference to our character. So I can drag in a reference to our character, get character. And from our character, I should be able to get a reference to our activated gameplay ability. But I can't. It's not in there. I can't get a reference to activated gameplay ability. And why is that? Because this activated gameplay ability variable is stored on our third person character. And let me go back over to our animation blueprint. This right here is a reference to the character blueprint class, which is less specific than the third person character blueprint class. And so because of that, I can't get access to the variables on third person character if I'm just referencing character. So I need to change this. I need to make this reference into a third person character and then I can actually access it. But I'm not gonna mess with that because that came with the animation blueprint. I'm gonna keep that exactly the same. But instead, if I come all the way up here, so right up here, event blueprint initialize animation, this is where it sets the character reference. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cast to third person character. So BP third person character. So I've got to get the owning actor just like I do here. So I can do this. And from this, I can then as BP third person character, I can promote this to a variable. And I'm just going to call this variable. Well, I'll just call it third person character. And you see here that the type is now third person character and differentiated from character up here. I'm just gonna put it under the same references category, under category here, references. And I'll extend out this comment box. All right, so now we've got our reference to our owning character, but also the third person character, which is what we need. So if I come down here, finally, I should be able to get a reference to our activated gameplay ability. So get third person character. And let's get our activated gameplay ability. There it is. So from our activated gameplay ability, what do we need to do? Well, we need to activate the primary Niagara system. And so this function is really calling this event right here. So I can connect this up. And if we want to test out, make sure that this is actually working. Let's do a print string. And let's say something like activated primary gameplay ability. Or no, primary Niagara system. That looks good. All right, compile and save. Let's test this out. Two, and Niagara system on. There it is, activated primary Niagara system and I can spam it, and I still get stuck in this pose. I still get stuck from time to time if I'm spamming it. The other thing that might happen is you might get an error after you cancel out of this, and the reason is that if you're spamming this over and over and over again, this event might get called when the gameplay ability is actually destroyed. So what I think is a good idea is I'm gonna copy and paste these references, and I'm just gonna do an is valid check here. So it's only gonna go ahead with the activation if the gameplay ability is actually valid. So actually to clean this up a little bit, I'm just gonna delete this, and I'm gonna connect this up also to that, and I'll move these out just a little bit compile save. So it's working pretty well, right? So we've got the ability, but there's still some issues. So one issue is that I can still move around even though I'm in this permanent state. Uh, another issue is that I could be very close to a wall or a pillar like this and hit two and then psh, I just go straight through a wall because there's no collision check on my hands or my body for that matter. And the other thing is that the intensity variable that we just set, that's not having any effect on the intensity of our actual flamethrower. So let's actually do that first. So let's set this intensity variable to determine how intense the flamethrower actually is. So the way we're going to do that is if you go back into your content drawer, we go back over to the Niagara system. So under Niagara, their gameplay abilities, fire, flamethrower. We're going to duplicate this. We're going to keep this as our base Niagara effect. And that way we can always refer back to it in case we mess up the new one. But we're going to duplicate it. And we're going to name it NS Fire Flamethrower with UP. And the UP stands for user parameter because basically we're going to pass in this intensity variable into our Niagara system. And that's going to determine how many particles spawn. So we'll go into that Niagara system. And just like previous episodes on Niagara, we're going to set a user exposed parameter here. We're going to make new common. We're going to set this to be a float. And we're going to aptly name it intensity. 
And now for our intensity variable, how do we use that? Well, under spawn rate right here. So we can just plug this immediately into the spawn rate right there. So that's for our first emitter. For our second emitter, you heard me say it's roughly five times as many particles as our first emitter, right? So what do we got to do? Well, instead of 100 here, I'm going to set this to be, if I do the drop down, I could set it to multiply. And we're going to multiply a float by int. And the float we're going to multiply is the same intensity. But if we want it to be five times as many particles, we've got to drag an intensity and then the integer is going to be five. And then we're going to do the same exact thing for our third emitter. We're going to do spawn rate, but this one's going to be multiplied by six. So I'll just go to the drop down and I'll search for multiply float by int and integer is going to be six. And the float again is going to be intensity. And when we do that, you'll see no particles spawning here because by default, the user variable set to zero. But here's the thing. So if we're spawning more particles in the flamethrower, I think logically you would expect that the flamethrower moves at a faster pace. So I also want to increase the velocity of the particles as they're coming out based on that user intensity. So here's what we're going to do under the add velocity here. So we're going to keep the random range vector. And then for the minimum and the maximum, we're basically going to adjust these to have a floor. So they're always going to be a minimum velocity of a certain value, but we can add on additional velocity as the particle system scales up in intensity. So I'm going to set this to instead be add vector. And the vector that we're adding is a minimum of x300. So it's always going to come out with a velocity of 300 at a minimum. And then the b value here from this, we basically got to assign our intensity to it. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make vector. So make vector will then break this into three different floats. And then I can assign our user intensity. And so I'm going to assign our user intensity to the z. Now for the x, that's the forward motion. So that I want it to come out a little bit more intensely. So for that, I'm going to multiply by a float, or actually multiply float by int. So we're going to multiply our user intensity there, and I'm going to multiply it by about two. Okay, so the way this is going to work is, let's say the intensity is 20, right? So then it's going to add 300 to 20. So the x is going to be 20 times two, so 40, and it's going to be 340 at a minimum. And then for the z, it's going to be, well, 20 at a minimum. So now on to the maximum. So we're going to do the same kind of thing. We're going to add a vector and the X will be 500 and the Z will be 30. And then for the B, we're going to make a vector. And for the X, once again, we're going to multiply float by int. And the float we're multiplying is the intensity and the int. So this is the maximum. So it's going to be a little bit higher. So I'm going to multiply it by three instead of the two up here. And the Z, I'm still going to add on just user intensity just like this. And for the Y, that's going to be sideways motion. So that's not going to do anything. So I know that was a whole lot of work. So instead of having to update that for both the add velocity nodes here, how about we just delete out this and we take this one, let's copy that particular node and we'll paste it right below shape location, paste, and we'll do the same thing here. Delete out this one, copy add velocity and paste it right underneath shape location. The one change I'm going to make to distortion is I'm just going to make the distortion kind of rise up a little bit faster than the fire. So this Z is going to be 30 and this one's going to be 60 because in general, that's distortion. It's always kind of above the fire in my experience. All right. So we're all set with the Niagara system. So we're going to go back into our gameplay ability fire. So now that we got our Niagara system here and we're setting a variable for that, well, directly from that variable, we can set a float parameter. So particle system set float parameter. And what's the parameter name? Well, we aptly titled it intensity. And that was the name of our user parameter in the Niagara system. And now we can get a reference to intensity. And that's actually stored on the gameplay ability, the parent class of gameplay ability fire, connect this up. And so now that's going to set directly based on our intensity here. So compile and save. But there's one last step we have to do. We have to go back into our third person character blueprint. And as it currently stands, we have the original flamethrower Niagara system here. We have to switch this to the new one. So if I search for flamethrower, not firepower, flamethrower with user parameter, we got to switch it to that one. Compile and save and let's give this a whirl. All right, I hit two. There's our system. And it looks just about the same, right? Because we haven't adjusted the intensity. So the intensity of 20, that was basically the same as the base value. But now let's adjust that intensity to like 100. And that'll really be the test. So compile and save. We'll see how that goes. And by the way, it's also going to have our performance implications. So the higher the intensity, the more particles, the heavier performance. So our FPS is at about 68 there. 
And yeah, so that's a much more intense flamethrower. And it did drop her FPS considerably there. So something to keep in mind, depending on how intense you want to make this. So the next issue we're going to solve is the fact that I can just keep uh, moving around even though I'm not walking in any capacity. So for these channeled spells, I really want the player to be stuck in that one position. That's not to say they won't be able to aim, so they'll be able to turn the upper part of their body all over the place, basically in a 180 degree arc and aiming with the channeled ability. But their feet should remain planted. So basically while a channeled spell is active, we need to disable all movement for our character. So let's go back into our gameplay ability fire blueprint. But where's our character movement actually defined? So that's defined on the third person character blueprint, this character movement component. But we actually want to disable the movement as soon as the ability begins, right? So not when the Niagara system gets generated, but as soon as the start animation begins, we don't want the player to be able to move. Well, unless they interrupt the ability itself. So we're going to come up here to our activate fire ability. And so right after these two, this is where we're going to disable movement. So we need to get a reference to our third person character so I can copy that. And then we need to get a reference to our movement component, get movement component. And the way we can easily disable movement completely is we can set the movement mode. So the movement mode is like what type of movement is the character in? And so we have a few different modes. The default is walking, but we also have swimming, falling, flying. So we can set this to none, and then the character won't be able to move at all. But then we also need a way of restoring our character back to normal. And I thought about this, and I thought about doing it on the deactivate fire ability. But I don't think that's the right place to do it, because we want to deactivate the ability, but there's still some period of time where the character is kind of coming out of their animation. And if they can immediately begin moving before that animation finishes, again, it's not going to look right, because they're going to be moving without their feet actually moving. So I think we need a second event. I think we need something after this that occurs when the character end animation actually ends, and that's when everything will go back to normal. So to handle this, we're going to go back into our animation blueprint, and we're going to open up our spellcasting standing still state machine again. And really, we want this to trigger at the end of the channeled spell end. So I'll go into that, and I'll go into that animation here. And I'm just going to pause the animation, move it to about here. And we'll create a new Anim Notify here by right-clicking, Add Notify, New Notify, and I'm going to call this End Spell Restore. So now that I have this new Anim Notify, I can go back to our animation blueprint. I can go back to the event graph. And at the bottom of the event graph here, I'm going to create a new Anim Notify event. So if I search for End Spell Restore, I can get that. And then from there, I can get a reference to our character. So we'll go back to References. We'll get our third person character. And actually, I've got a reference to our character movement component already here. So I can drag that in. And I can set the movement mode right from here. Set movement mode. And we'll make this right back to walking and connect this up. Compile save. So here we go. Hit two. And can I move? No. I'm trying to use W, A, S, and D. I cannot move at all. Hit two again and. I still can't move. So what's happening here is that our end spell restore event is never actually being hit because the transition back to the normal kind of idle spell casting animation is happening before it gets to this point. So it's happening kind of in the midpoint. Now we are going to solve this issue completely. But for now, what will solve it is if you move it to like the center of the animation. So then it will be hit. And then it will make the transition. So one more test here Two. Can't move at all. Two again, and I'm back to normal. So we will solve this in a much more elegant way in just a little bit. But let's solve another issue first. So this next thing, this could be a gameplay issue if we don't do it right, because you could end up with wall hacks and all sort of exploitive behavior that really I don't want. And that is, when I do the ability, my player actually goes right through whatever the uh, solid object is there. So you can see I can actually shoot the flamethrower through a wall. And I thought about a few different ways of solving this. Like we could do a two bone IK where the hands pull back, but that would be kind of awkward, right? Like the whole body is forward channeling a spell, but the hands are like right here. It really doesn't make sense. I thought about it from a more realistic perspective, which is if I was in that body and I was about to do that, as soon as my hands hit the object, I would just pull back and say, no, I'm not doing that spell. Realistically, a player is not going to slam their arms into a wall. So why don't we do just a really short capsule collision trace in front of the player, like right before the ability starts. And if it has a hit, then it just ends the animation and stops the ability. And by doing that, then it discourages the player from trying that ability up really close to a solid object. We could do this by creating a brand new Atom Notify at the very end of this channel spell begin. But because we already have something like that, so let's go back to the event graph. We already have this Atom Notify activate main ability effect. And so why don't we just tie it to that? Because we could just do the collision check right before 
And if we don't get a collision hit, then we'll activate the primary Niagara system. So here's what I'm going to do to start. I'm just going to create a lot of space here because we need to do the collision check. And also down here, I'm going to move this down. So now I'm going to get a reference to our third person character here. And specifically, I'm going to get a reference to the capsule component because we're going to do the collision relative to where the capsule is at that moment in time. And we have to get the world transform, get the world transform of the capsule. And I'm going to transform the location. And what this is saying is where are we starting the collision trace? And this is going to be at z equals 20 because think of z equals zero at about the midpoint of the capsule. So basically at waist level and z equals 20 is going to be about chest level. So where the arms are coming out and then I can copy that and duplicate it. And where is it going? So it's sticking to z equals 20, but the forward vector of the capsule is X. So it's going to go out about 120 units, about 120 centimeters out from the chest. And that's just a little bit further than the player's arms. And I can connect this up here. So now from this pin here, I'm going to do a sphere trace by channel, sphere trace by channel. And the start of the trace is going to be here and the end is going to be right here. The radius is going to be pretty small, about 10, because for the radius, I'm thinking about, well, how wide are the arms? So they're not too wide apart. And to be honest, you could make this a little bit wider, but I think 10 is good. And the trace channel of visibility, that's just fine. Make sure you keep ignore self because we don't want this to get a hit on the player's own arms. And just so that we can visualize this when testing it out, I'm going to set the draw debug to for duration, and then it'll draw something on the screen for five seconds. And then here's what we're going to do. So we'll drag out a pin and this is going to be a branch because if it gets a hit, then it's going to do this true branch. And if it doesn't, then it'll do this false. So if it doesn't get a hit, meaning there's no solid object right in front of the player, then it's going to do all this. It's going to activate the primary Niagara system. But if it does get a hit, what do we want it to do? So in that case, I want to deactivate the ability, right? So I'm going to get a reference to our third person character again, and I'm going to get a reference to our gameplay ability. So get activated gameplay ability, just move this down here for space. And then I can just deactivate the ability, deactivate ability. And I'm just going to add a comment so I know exactly what I'm doing here. And actually, let me just create some space here just so I can separate this out. So I'll add a comment right there, move this out here. And the comment's going to be collision check in front of player if when spellcasting ability, arms will hit solid object. Compile and save. All right, so I'm about to cast the spell. Will it go right through the wall? But all of a sudden, now that I'm doing that, I can't move. I can't do anything. Yeah, I can't move at all. And I also get this issue saying attempted to access Niagara system via property da 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 da, but it's not valid because the Niagara system doesn't even exist yet. So what's going on here? So what's happening here is I'm deactivating the ability before the end animation ever plays. And because our end animation is what's triggering the set movement mode back to walking, I'm never going back to walking. So how can I ensure that this Anim Notify end spell restore is always hit? So the best way of doing this is tying this event to a transition event. So when it's transitioning from one state machine to another, so we're in spell casting, we transition back to locomotion, or if we're in one state and transitioning to another state, and it's a really clean and elegant way to do this. So let's set that up. So if we go to spell casting standing still back to our state machine, we could do the end spell restore when this occurs, when it transitions from here to here. But I think I want to do it at the very, very end, like the last thing that happens. And so that last transition is where we transition back to locomotion, which is occurring in main states. So if we go into main states, it's really this right here from spell casting standing still back to locomotion. So it's this right here. And you'll see on the right hand side, we have these transition events where we can actually trigger in Anim Notify when, for example, the transition from one to the other is started or when it's ended. And for this, I want to do it when it's ending. And so what needs to go in right here is if I go back to our event graph, it's basically this exact name. So end spell restore in that case. So let me go back to main states and back to that transition. And this is going to be end spell restore. I think this is case sensitive. So make sure to get that exactly right because that transition is always going to occur. We're always going to go back to locomotion. And so that's a really safe way of setting the transition. So now that I've done that, I can go back into our channeled spell here. Let's go back to the spell casting standing still. I can go back to the end animation right here and I can actually delete this out because we don't need it and save that. So let's test this out now. We're still going to get an error in the error log for the Niagara system, but we're going to solve that in much the same way. All right, so I'm right up against the wall. Boop, and I'm back to being able to move all set. And I can try again and boop. Yep, same thing. But we're still getting those errors. Attempted to access Niagara system, but Niagara system is not valid. And the reason that's occurring is because here, when it gets a hit and then it tries to deactivate the ability. So it goes to deactivate the ability and that ends up here. 
and then when it does deactivate fire ability, then it says destroy component. But there's nothing to destroy because the Niagara system hasn't even been created yet. And the other thing that's happening is it's never actually destroying the overall actor, the overall gameplay ability, even when it gets interrupted. Because the destruction is actually occurring right now on our third person character blueprint. We have the destroy actor here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to transition this destroy actor over to the end spell restore on our animation blueprint. So I'm going to come down here right next to end spell restore set movement mode. We're going to keep that, but we need a reference to our third person character. We need another reference to our gameplay ability, activated gameplay ability. And then from there, that's where we're going to destroy it. So destroy actor. And because this path is always being taken at the end of an animation, then we can safely remove that from third person character. So we can delete it here. And for our first ability, this is kind of a weird ability because it's not actually doing anything. It's the torchlight effect. I think I'm gonna keep it like this for now. Uh, but in the future, I probably wanna simplify this and just make it all consistent. But for now, I'm just gonna keep it. So compile and save. And there's another very similar fix that I wanna make right now. So back in our animation blueprint, let's go back into our spellcasting standing still state machine. Go back to our channeled spell begin into this right here. So this activate main ability effect, again, what if we get interrupted like right here? So we'll have activated the effect, but our player will be, well, back to a normal state. So instead of being right here, I'm gonna delete this out, activate main ability effect, save this. And if we go back to our spell casting standing still state machine, so why don't we use a transition event instead? So right here, and this is where we did it before. But I did some testing on this and it actually looks better if the animation begins right here, like when the transition starts. Because you gotta remember, this is taking 0.2 seconds. And those Niagara particles, well, they take like a fraction of a second to charge up, but there is a period of time. So if we do it at the start, it's gonna be at the start of that 0.2 seconds. So this is gonna be activate main ability effect. And make sure you get this verbatim. And compile and save, let's test this out again. All right, here I go, two, and there's the effect. And I can spam it, yep, and it's back to normal. And it's going, it's going, let's try it on a rock. And boop, and yep, looks good, and I can do it again. But you could still get an error, attempted to access Niagara system, but Niagara system is not valid, pending kill or garbage. And the reason for this is because the actor could be destroyed before we actually deactivate the Niagara system. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a deactivate primary Niagara system event, and that's gonna occur right before the actor gets destroyed. Because you gotta think of it this way, we're always gonna start the animation, so we're gonna create an actor, and then we're gonna create the Niagara system. And then we wanna destroy the Niagara system before the actor itself is created. It's like first in, last out. So for this, we have to go back to our main gameplay ability and I'm gonna create a new event. So we have activate primary Niagara system. So now we're gonna do a custom event and we're going to do deactivate primary Niagara system. And now I'm gonna to go to gameplay ability fire. We're gonna do the same exact thing. So deactivate fire ability. And if I go right above that, so we have our activate primary fire Niagara system. I'm gonna do a custom event here and we're gonna do deactivate primary fire Niagara system. So right from here, we're gonna get a reference to our Niagara system and we're gonna confirm, is it valid? So if it's valid, we're gonna do the second one there. If it is valid, then we'll deactivate it, but really destroy it. So Niagara system here and destroy component, right like that. Now, if it's not valid, we don't need to deactivate it. We don't need to destroy it because it doesn't exist. And then back in our gameplay ability, we gotta reference the fire ability. So we gotta take our same switch here, copy that down here and do this. And then from gameplay ability fire, we have to deactivate primary fire Niagara system. So last but not least, back in our animation blueprint, let's go back to the event graph. So in the end spell restore, so you heard me say we always wanna create the actor first, then the Niagara system, then destroy the Niagara system, and then destroy the actor. So right here, this is where we have to deactivate the Niagara system. So I can copy our reference to our activated gameplay ability, and then we can deactivate the primary Niagara system. So that's always going to be done. It's always at least going to be checked when we're coming out of the spellcasting standing still state machine. Compile, save, let's try this out one more time. Let's spam the ability as much as we can, see if we still get the error. Two, 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 two. Okay, let me actually finish the ability. Okay, two, two, and and try again, and see if we get any error. So we're still getting the error. So what did I forget? So back in our gameplay ability fire, we have our destroy component right here, and we don't need that anymore because now we're calling this one, and then it's destroying the component. So I'm gonna delete it here. 
Now for our actual light only for our initial torch effect, I'm going to keep it there, but I think it's just a good practice to have the is valid right there. And only if it's valid, will we destroy the component. And what I might end up doing is actually collapsing this to a function and then it could be used here as well. But let's keep it this way for now. I think that's simple enough. Compile and save. Let's test this one last time. I hope no more errors. All right, here we go. So we're spamming the ability finished spam, 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 spam. And you'll notice that the fire kind of lingers there for a moment. And I'm going to talk about how we're going to fix that in just a second. But let's see if we get any errors. Nope, nothing good to go. So let's talk about how we want to address this issue where when I hit two again, yeah, the flames kind of persist for the duration of the end animation, right? Because really what I want to have happen is I want the flame to stop spawning at the source, like at the player's hands. But I do want the flames that have already been emitted to stay for like half a second. So what if we make this a two tiered effect? So basically the flames would stop spawning, but the emitter would still exist. And only when the flames are actually gone completely does the emitter destroy itself, like auto destruct. So for this, we got to open up our Niagara system again. So I'm going to go to content drawer, back to our content, and then Niagara, gameplay abilities, fire, flamethrower, and our flamethrower with user parameters. So basically what we have to do here is we have to make the spawning of the particles conditional. So conditional on a Boolean parameter in this case. So if that Boolean parameter is true, then they'll spawn. And then we can set that Boolean parameter to false when we want the spawn to stop. So I'm going to come back up to user exposed parameters, plus sign under make new and then common, we can select bool. And this is going to be spawn particles. And then for spawn rate here, instead of just user intensity, here's what we're going to do. So we can search for bool can make a custom float from bool and the bool is going to be whether or not to spawn particles. So I'll put that in there. So the true float is what? Well, it's just our intensity in this case. So I can drag that in and if it's false, zero particles being spawned. And then we could do that same kind of thing for the second and the third emitter. So I'll search for bool, drag it in. And for the true float, remember, we got to multiply by int, multiply float by int, pull in our intensity. Integer is going to be five here. And false in this case, still going to be zero, nothing spawning. And then on to our last emitter, bool, spawn particles. If it's false, zero, true, I'm going to do multiply float by int. And I think this was six, right? So we got to take our intensity float and six. Save. Now we've got to set this bool when the Niagara system is spawned because otherwise nothing's going to spawn. So I'm going to close out of the Niagara system and back to gameplay ability fire here. If I go up to activate primary fire Niagara system. So here's our system and here's where we set the intensity variable. And now what we can do is we can also set a bool parameter. And here it is under particle system set bool parameter. And I'm just going to add a reroute here move this down. And what's our parameter name? So spawn particles and by default, it's going to be true. So I'll check that compile save. So then remember, we have two different events, we have a deactivation of the actual effect. But then we have the destruction of the Niagara system and the overall actor. And so we don't want to set this back to false on the destruction, we want to set it back on the deactivation. So when the player first lowers his hand, that's when we want to deactivate the effect. So I can come down here. And so it's not this so the deactivate, I should probably have named this destroy, but this one's going to happen last. So I'm going to move this down. And then this one, I'm going to move up a little bit. It's going to happen right here. So I can select this right here and pull it in set bool parameter. And I'm going to uncheck it in this case, I got to get a reference to our Niagara system, connect that up, connect this up. And that's what's actually going to set this to stop spawning particles. And once we set this up, you know, we shouldn't even need to have to destroy the component to destroy the Niagara system. One thing to make sure is when you spawn the system, just set it to auto destroy here. So what that does is when the system actually stops spawning particles for some period of time, like it's basically inactive, the system will auto destroy. And in the Niagara system, if you select the actual system itself, there's this auto deactivate setting here. And it says auto deactivate system if all emitters are determined to not spawn particles again, regardless of lifetime. So that would be true once this variable, this Boolean variable is set to false. So once we set this setting in the gameplay ability fire to auto destroy, compile and save and let's give this a whirl. All right, so now two, I can't move while it's casting. That's good. And when I hit two again, as soon as the player starts pulling back back to a normal position, the fire should at least stop spawning at the hands, but stay in the air linger there in the air. So let's see. Yeah, there we go. 
So what I'm noticing though, is that when I hit two, you'll see that it still kind of abruptly disappears. So back in our gameplay ability fire blueprint, that's being caused by this. And I think if I just disable this, let's test it out. We might not even need it. So now two, and then I stop casting and the fire lingers. Yep, the fire doesn't go away until it's actually done, until the particles disappear. So that means I can actually delete out this custom event. And I always like simplifying, compile, save, go back to our gameplay ability. Also gonna delete out this, compile and save, back to our animation blueprint. We can get rid of this as well under end spell restore. And we'll just connect this up like that. And do one last test, we'll keep this as simple as possible. I apologize guys, jumping us through hoops, but sometimes that's what it takes. We gotta do some trial and error, figure out what makes sense. So spamming the ability a lot, spawn the system, spawn the system again, spawn the system again. Yep, Let's see any errors? Nothing, we're good. Now, the last major feature that we're gonna set up this episode is a sound, flamethrower sound that you heard all the way in the intro. And for this, we're gonna use a free sound from Zapsplat. And the best one I found is this medium soft fire whooshes. And what's neat about it is there's actually two sounds in one. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna download this MP3 format, I'm gonna transition it to WAV format via Audacity, and then I'll show you how to edit it in Audacity to get it ready. So now that I've got this in Audacity open, I can just drag it in. And what we really need is we need the sound kind of in the middle. We don't need the intro, we don't need the end, but we need both of these sounds. So I'm gonna cut it from about here, and then from about here over, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this, paste it as a separate sound down here. And then for the second one, I'm gonna do the same kind of thing. So I'm just gonna take from about there, it doesn't have to be perfect, delete it out, and then to about, right about there. And one thing you wanna do is try to make the sounds be actually a different length, slightly staggered. And you'll understand why when we get into it in Unreal Engine. And just to see how it sounds, you can just mute one and play the other as a solo. Pretty good, and then mute the other. So far, so good. So now I'm gonna to go to File, and then Export, and then Export Multiple, and we'll just export them to Downloads in this case. So now we wanna rename these. So I just wanna call this one Flamethrower Channel 1, and the second one's gonna be Flamethrower Channel 2. So now back in Unreal Engine, I'm gonna to go to Content Drawer and then over to Content and Sound, we're gonna create a new sound folder called Gameplay Abilities. And then under Gameplay Abilities, I'm gonna create a new folder for Fire. And I'll give that a nice color too. Let's set the color to orange. So now I can go over to our download folder, drag our two flamethrower channel into that folder. And test them out. So now let's create our sound cue. So if we select both, right click and create a single cue and we'll call this flamethrower channel, eliminate the two there, flamethrower channel cue, go into that. And so in the cue for each of these, I'm just gonna set it to loop and this one also. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is under output, I'm gonna give these an attenuation setting of our footstep hard surface attenuation. And we set this up back in episode, I think it's 19 footstep effects but uh, just to go into that and show you that. So it's a non-spatialized attenuation. It's emanating in a sphere of a radius of about 50, so that's right around the hands. And then the fall off distance, it's about 10 meters. All right, so our cue's all set, save that, exit out. So now back in our gameplay ability fire, we have to set this sound to begin playing. And I was thinking about this and we could set it to begin play as soon as the Niagara system is spawned. But I think I actually want the sound to start a little bit earlier. And you're gonna see why. But uh, basically I want the sound to slowly like ramp up over time. And at first, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking to myself, well, it should probably start playing as soon as the Niagara system starts spawning, right? But then in testing this out, the effect was a lot better if I started the playing just before the Niagara system. So instead of starting it down here when the Niagara system is spawned, about 0 0.2, 0 0.4 seconds earlier, which is when the effect actually starts. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a new audio component. And we'll just add audio flamethrower channel cue but actually I'm gonna call this audio component the primary Niagara audio. 
And by default, that's set the flamethrower channel Niagara Q, and that's fine. But we actually have to set what this audio is going to be. We've got to spawn it at a specific time. So it's going to be right after our animation starts, which is right here. So first, I have to get a reference to our third person character, not the animation, but the actual third person character, because we're going to attach this to the player's hand. So I'll get a reference to the mesh from there. And then from the mesh, we're going to spawn sound attached. And then I can connect this up. I can expand this to specify the hand. So it's going to be the hand underscore R socket. And this we set up in episode 23. So this was the torch light effect episode where we first set up the socket in our hand. And we don't need to worry about attenuation because we set that up in the sound cue. But I can actually select our sound cue right here. So let's search for flamethrower channel cue. And you've heard me say this before in other episodes, but I really like starting a sound in a random float in a range. So this sound is very short. So it's always going to be, let's say, 0 to, let's say, like 0 0.5 seconds. And this way, it always starts sounding a little bit different every time. Now, with the return value here, that's where I'm going to set our primary Niagara audio. So I can set it right there. So let's test this out now. But there's going to be a few problems. So compile and save, and let's give it a go. So two. So you see the problem already, right? So the sound started way too soon. And then when I hit it two again, sound keeps going. So we're going to solve both these problems with the same functionality. We're going to use something that we haven't used before in this series that I really love and I feel like it's really underutilized. And that's called an atom curve. And think of an atom curve as a way of driving an effect, basically the intensity of an effect during an animation. And the reason we're going to use an atom curve is as the player is about to start casting the flamethrower. So they're pulling back and they're about to go like this that's when we want the sound to ramp up and it's going to ramp up very quickly but we don't want it to go from 0 to 60 in 0 seconds we want it to take about maybe 0 0.2 seconds to actually ramp up to full and so to set up the atom curves we're going to go into our animation blueprint and back into our spell casting standing still state machine and we actually have to do this on three separate animations right because what we want is about halfway through the begin animation so let me actually go into that the begin animation here so about halfway through this animation right about at this point so right when the player's arms are about to go forward that's when we want to start ramping up the sound. Previously, we've done a lot with notifies over here, but we haven't done anything with curves, and that's exactly what we're going to do now. So we're gonna add a curve, create a curve, and I'm gonna call this curve Effect Intensity. And to go into that curve, we can double click. And so this curve can be used to drive all sorts of things. So at any moment in time when that animation is playing, we can get a value of that curve and pass that into a blueprint. So for example, if you have like a dragon with a crazy fire breathing animation, but the fire needs to change in intensity over the course of the animation, you could have a curve for that and you could tie how strong that fire is going to be at any given point in the animation. So you could do all sorts of neat stuff with this. But in our case, we're doing a very simple example here, which is just the sound volume. So to start, the volume's gonna be zero. And it's only once we get to about here that the volume's gonna ramp up. And I found it to be right about here, a little bit past the halfway point where it has the best effect. So we're gonna right click and we're gonna add a key. And now if I come over to the end of this, and I can also right click right there and add another key. And the key is a way of defining a value. So I can select that key, and up here, so at time unit one, at the end of the animation, I'm gonna make this a value of one. And if you can't see the top of this graph, I can zoom out using my mouse wheel and then using the right mouse button to kind of navigate around. And so now the value of this during the animation, zero, 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 at this point, it starts going up, ramps up to one very quickly. Now, the other thing I like doing here is I like changing these curves to be smooth. So it's not this abrupt transition up. So if you right click on the key, we can select auto and that auto curves it basically. And at this point, that's where the sound's gonna reach full volume. So that looks good. Let's save this and let's exit out of this one. We'll go back to our animation blueprint, spell casting standing still. Let's go into our channeled spells now, go into this one and we'll do the same thing. I'm just gonna pause this, we'll add a curve. And because we already created the curve, then we can find it right here. So we can search for effect intensity. There it is. And I can double click on that. Now for this, for the channeled spell, it's always gonna be an effect strength of one, right? Because we want a steady state volume while the channeling is going on. So I can just add a single key anywhere on there just by right clicking and select that and I'll make that one. 
and I can zoom out, just make sure that the whole line is there. Yeah, so if you create a single key, it's going to set that whole line to be that value. It's only when you create a second key or a third key, then you can change the graph. And you can have a lot of keys in a single animation. So you could have an effect where it charges up and then it goes back down. So that looks good. I'm going to save and exit out of this. And we'll go into our very last one. So spellcasting standing still, our end animation, pause this. And we want the sound to begin fading right away. So again, I'm going to add my curve. I'll search for effect intensity. There we go. Double click. And we'll right click add our key. So that first key is going to be a time of zero and a value of one. And then it's going to go down pretty fast. So by the time it gets to about here, the sound should be pretty much zero. So let's right click and we'll add a key and this one will be zero. And then again, let's right click and say auto tangent and this one too. So right click auto tangent and there we go, creates an auto curve. Save and close out of that. And then back in our gameplay ability fire. So we have our curves, but how do we actually change the volume of this based on the curve value? So the one thing I'm going to say to start is when we spawn the effect, let's make the volume multiplier at zero. So let's actually start it with a volume of zero. And then the curve is what's going to slowly ramp it up across time. But from previous episodes, we know that basically the only thing that we can do to change something over time, or at least to change it smoothly over time, is to use tick functionality. So that's what we're going to do here. And I know it has performance implications, but for changing the volume of something just isn't that much of a performance impact. So I think it's safe to use event tick. So we're going to right click. I always do event tick all the way at the top of our event graph. So we're going to right click and we'll search for event tick. And there we go. So we don't want this event tick to be doing a lot of stuff unless it has to, right? So I'm first going to get the primary Niagara audio. And then from that, I can do a is valid check. And that's going to make sure that the Niagara audio actually exists before it goes forward. So then if it does exist, I'm going to get another reference to it, get, and then I'm going to set the volume multiplier. And I'll connect this up just like that. Now our volume is going to be based on the curve value, right? So how do we get a reference to the curve value? Well, first we got to get a reference to our animation blueprint because that's where it's stored. So if I search for ABP, get ABP third person character reference. And now from this, we can get a curve value. And the curve name is called effect intensity. I think this is case sensitive. So make sure you spell this right. And we can connect this up to the volume. The last thing we got to do is for the primary Niagara audio here, make sure you don't have a sound assigned because otherwise it's just going to start playing right away. Compile and save and let's test this out. Moment of truth. Here we go. Yeah, looking pretty good Two again and it stops. So now the only thing left to do is to adjust the volume and the pitch based on the intensity of the effect. So back in our gameplay ability fire blueprint, I'm just going to move out some space next to event tick here. We've got to create some space so that we can do a little bit of a calculation. And this right here for the get curve value, this is going to be the basis of the calculation. But we have to decide on how intense should be kind of the average volume. And I think an intensity of 100 is good. And that's what it's set to right now. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get the intensity and then from the intensity, we'll divide that by 100 because that's going to give us a value of one. So normal volume. And so if our intensity is 20, then this whole equation will be 0.2 and we can multiply 0.2 times whatever the curve value is. It'll be a lower volume. So I'm just going to do multiply, connect this up. And the last thing I always do is I like to clamp this because sounds, you never want to sound being like a hundred times volume, blow out your speakers. So let's clamp this to a float clamp at minimum of zero, maximum of two times volume and connect that up. So now the pitch similar, but just a little bit different. So we need another reference to our primary Niagara audio. And before we set the volume multiplier, let's set a pitch multiplier. And so our equation for pitch, it's similar, but a little bit different. So we're going to start by getting intensity. And then I need to figure out, is it less than 100 or greater than 100? So we're going to subtract 100. And that's going to give us either a positive or negative number. And then from that, we actually need to divide by 100. And that's going to give us like what percentage of the pitch up or down should it be? But we don't want to change the pitch that much, right? So I'll actually, I'm going to divide this by 10. And then we have to add this to our normal pitch. So our normal pitch is just one. So I'll do a plus sign, connect this up. Normal pitch is one. And then I'll connect that whole thing up to this. So for intensity of 100, the pitch shouldn't change at all, right? So intensity of 100, 100 minus 100 is zero, divided by 100 is zero, divided by 10 is zero, and one plus zero is one. 
But if intensity is 20, then 20 minus 100 is negative 80, divided by 100 is point, negative 0.8, and then divided by 10 is negative 0.08, and that's gonna affect the pitch just slightly. But again, I wanna clamp this. So I'm gonna clamp it between, let's do a clamp float between 0 0.8 and 1.2. We never want the pitch to change that much. All right, compile and save, and let's test this out. So we'll start with 100 and go from there. So two. Everything sounds good. Let's go back in our third person character blueprint. Intensity, let's set that to something small like 20. Test again. Two. Yeah, very light effect and the volume's light too. I like it. And let's contrast that now with something extreme. So let's go up to 200. 10 times the effect. Compile, save. Yeah. So a little bit higher pitch and a lot higher volume. Last few things we're going to do are all for organization. So back to the event tick. So if I go to gameplay fire here, so I'm just gonna take everything under event tick here and we're gonna collapse this to a function. Right click, collapse to function. And I can right click and say rename and this is gonna be volume and pitch adjustment, adjustment based on intensity. And I can go into that and then just organize it a little bit better. I apologize guys, one really quick fix. So the problem is that the primary Niagara audio is always valid because we always have a component even if it's not being played. So instead of is valid here, what we wanna do is drag out a pin and get is active. And this returns whether or not the audio component is actually active because we only wanna have it adjust all this stuff if it's active. So I'm gonna connect this up, delete the is valid pin here and then connect it up to our set volume multiplier only if it's true. That looks good, compile and save. In our animation blueprint, what I did is I classified each of these four variables that we set up. Some of these are from previous episodes, but I put them all under the category of spell casting, just so that they're cleanly organized under my blueprint. The very last thing I wanna go over is I noticed some performance challenges with the Niagara system. So let me show you what I mean. So right now the ability intensity is about 200. So watch our FPS in the top right corner. So it's sitting at about 60 to 58, something like that, and two. And now it drops down to 37, 38. Yeah, so what I noticed is having that effect or causing that effect. If we go back into our Niagara system, the main culprit is this light renderer here. Now the effect does look better with this light renderer because it's emitting light, but if we disable it, it's still emitting some light and it still looks pretty good. And the effect then is negligible. It's like a two FPS change, so let me show you. So we're sitting at about 60 FPS, two drop down to 58 yeah barely had an effect it's like a 3 fps change and so what i think i'll end up doing is i'll keep this turned off and you might be asking yourself well why aren't you using a gpu emitter for the second one especially there are really two reasons one is that i tried switching it to gpu and using hardware ray tracing for the collision and for whatever reason, the collision wasn't working properly with these particles. So if you play with this as a GPU emitter and you get it working pretty well, uh, I'd be really excited to see your settings. So please post in the comments below. But the other reason is that once this effect starts interacting with the environment, I think I'm gonna need to pass data in terms of how many particles are colliding. I think I'm gonna need to pass data back into the blueprint so we could figure out things like how fast something burns, how much damage is caused, stuff like that. And if we're gonna pass data, they need to be CPU emitters. So that concludes today's episode. But you're probably thinking to yourself, but wait, Neil, we can't even aim this ability. How do we even use it in a game? And that's exactly what we're doing next episode. So I hope to see you there.